any of you ever read Pickles in the morning comic strips? It's one of my favorites. I love Pickles. Do you ever read Pickles? Only a couple of you? Pickles is an elderly couple. They're kind of funny. There's a grandson in there, too. But the author, the creator of this comic strip, every summer goes into the same theme. And that theme is, how do you get rid of excess zucchini? <laughs> Have you ever had that problem with excess zucchini? It shows that they've eaten all they can. They've frozen some. And now they've got all this zucchini that they need to get rid of. And they take baskets full to their neighbors. <laughs> and the comic strip shows the neighbors hiding behind the curtains and pretending they're not home because they don't want the zucchini either. In one cartoon strip that I remember, and I thought this was funny, they found a, a car where they had left, the people had left the window open. So they put this bag full of zucchini in the back seat of the car and they take off running before they're caught. So what do you do when you have too much zucchini? You're wondering where I'm going with this, don't you? <laughs> In the same respect, what do you do with an old Bible? Can you just throw it in the trash? Pages are falling out. Some of them might even be missing. Spine's broken. Or maybe it's in pretty good condition, but it's a translation that you don't use anymore, so it's just sitting on the shelf collecting dust. What do you do with it? You've asked your friends and neighbors if they want it, but they don't because they have a bunch of old Bibles of their own that they don't know what to do with. It's kind of like that extra zucchini from your garden. If you put it in the trash, you feel guilty. After all, this is a Bible. Now, some people send Bibles to third world countries, to missionaries. And that's a good use for them, but it's often very difficult to get an address to find out where to send them. Other people take them to the church and give them to the pastor. But she doesn't know what to do with them either. <laughs> a colleague tells me she has a stack of old Bibles that people have given her, and she, and she surely didn't want them because she has enough of her own. Fortunately, that hasn't happened to me. The only Bible that anyone ever gave me was a huge antique Bible that I was thrilled to have. And before I go any further, I want to tell you right now, please don't bring me your old Bible. <laughs> I have one of just about every translation already on my shelves, and I don't need any more. I noticed that we don't have a large pulpit Bible here. Most churches do have a large pulpit Bible. It's over there. There it is, over there but it's usually on the pulpit. And whenever a worship committee or a session decides to use a new translation, that Bible is retired, put someplace else. I've seen them in display cases in churches. I've seen them prominently displayed in libraries, and I've seen them just stored someplace. But we can't even bring ourselves to give them away. They become a part of the church history. They're important to us. So what is it about a Bible that causes so much emotion? Now, if you had an old dictionary that was falling apart, you wouldn't hesitate to throw it away and buy another one. Or if your dictionary was outdated, you'd get rid of it, but not your Bible. Now, I want to make it clear I'm not saying that the Bible can ever be outdated. God's word is never outdated. What I'm talking about is the language of particular Bibles. These older translations are sometimes very difficult for us to read. And so we put it on a shelf and we buy a new one with a more modern translation that we can understand better. Surveys have shown that the Bible is the best selling and the least read book ever published. <laughs> People just want to have one around, even if they never read it or never touch it except to dust it off and 
bring it out and put it on the coffee table when they know that the pastor's coming to visit. <laughs> it's good to look like you read it, even if you don't. Now today's epistle lesson from Paul's letter to the Hebrews talks about the Word of God. There are some who say that these verses are referring to Jesus Christ. They're a metaphor for Christ. And we hear that metaphor used in reference to Jesus frequently, beginning with the first verses of the Gospel of John, when the Apostle writes, in the beginning was the Word. There are other ex so-called experts who say the Word of God, in this case, refers to the Scriptures. It is living and active sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. Well, after reading that scholars, noted scholars, have opinions on both sides, I studied these few verses for a while, and I came to the conclusion that in this case, the word does refer to Jesus Christ. At least that's my opinion. That's important. Jesus is still living and active, and before him no creature is hidden. But there's still something to be said about Jesus appearing to us through the words of Scripture. Perhaps that's why we're so attached to this book, because we know it is the Word of God, and Jesus is alive on its pages. Yet, just as we sometimes take the presence of God for granted, we sometimes take this book for granted. That was brought home to me very clearly at a Presbytery meeting one time. We had a guest speaker who was a minister uh, in Africa. He told us about the struggles of people in his country, moving many listeners to tears as he described the plight of children and young adults who were dying of AIDS and tuberculosis by the thousands. And he described the poverty that people face every day. He told us how his faith in God helps him and many of his people through the hardships that they endure in a place where he, as a man of 40, had already surpassed the average lifespan. Then he held up a Bible, and with emotion in his voice, he referred to this precious book, with such meaning that I felt ashamed because I so often take it for granted. We forget that there are countries in which the Christian Bible has been banned and where a person can be imprisoned or even killed for just owning one. But in spite of that, there are people who take that risk and keep a Bible hidden in their house someplace, finding time to pull it out and read it every day, to study it, and to share private devotions with their friends and family. We forget that the Bible is more than just a bunch of moral lessons. It's the inspired Word of God. It is the Holy Spirit speaking to us through the history of God's people describing through poetry and prose the beauty of God's world and the struggles of kings and princes and ordinary people. It's the prophetic word of God by Elijah and Elisha, Esther and Ruth, Isaiah and Jeremiah, and scores of others. And then there are the Gospels, which tell us the good news of Jesus Christ and about salvation and forgiveness. It is so much more than just a book. It is truly this precious book. Perhaps that's why we can't throw it away when it gets old or when a particular translation becomes outdated. Perhaps that's why we want it around even if we don't bother to take time to read it. But a Bible sitting on a shelf is just another book. It doesn't become precious until we read the stories and try to understand just what it is that God's saying to us. A Bible sitting on a shelf might just as well be thrown in the trash. 
because there's no power in the unread word. The power lies in the reading and in the learning. The power lies in the message of God. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joint from marrow. And if you don't believe that, try reading this precious book sometime. I mean really reading it and find out for yourself. Let us pray. Holy and ever-present God, prod us to open the scriptures that we may learn and grow in our faith. Continue to open your word to us that we might understand your love for us and respond by showing others our love for you. Amen.